Hi, everybody. It's nice to have you here with us today on a Thursday afternoon. My name is Jessica. I am the Customer and Partner Success Manager with Inflectra. And today we have Jennifer Bonin with us. We are delighted to have her. Hi, Jen. She is the CEO of AI App Store Inc. and was the first female artificial intelligence platform tech CEO. AI App Store specializes in custom subscription technology bundles, leveraging an intelligent platform using a personalized virtual research assistant to enhance corporate growth. The company exceeds expectations of integration, testing, delivery, and management with a groundbreaking business model that is fully engaged in the sustainable development goals cultivated by the United Nations. That is such a cool mouthful, and we can't wait to hear more about that. Can you tell us? Yeah, that's a lot of words. <laughs> I hope I got them all right. Yes, you did great. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us a fun fact about yourself, Jen? Um, yeah, so a couple of things. I was just thinking about it um, as we were preparing for this, that um, often I see a lot of folks at these events and conferences in person, but rarely do I talk about um, my college career in golf. So I was actually um, a division one college golfer um, at one point in my life, which many people don't know. And it's actually a hilarious story because my dad was an athlete. He was actually a two sport division one athlete because they allowed that then you could play two sports. Um, but he had three girls and none of us were playing baseball or football. So his next best love was golf. So as young as I can remember, my dad would take me with him to hit golf balls in our backyard. So every day we would hit golf balls in the backyard, which eventually led to playing golf in college. And where did you go to school? Um, so I did University of Wisconsin. And then I was also, I transferred to St. Thomas for their business program. So the University of St. Thomas and the University of Wisconsin, both um, are universities that I call home. <laughs> no, so I'm originally from Wisconsin. And I went to the University of Wisconsin too, but well before you did, I'm sure. <laughs> Actually, I started at the University of Minnesota. I was a gopher for my freshman year. Yep. But my dad is also a huge golf fanatic, and he was the president of the Wisconsin State PGA for a while, but he would work tournaments um, at the UW all the time. So he was probably there one time when you were Absolutely. playing. Cool. <laughs> That's, That's really cool. I love it. That's awesome. Um, beautiful golf courses in Wisconsin and Minnesota. Oh yeah, they say like, I think there's a stat on Minnesota and we have more golf courses per capita than any other state. So besides lakes, what a lot of people don't know is we invested in golf courses. So we take full advantage of the four months out of the year that we can golf and be on the lake. Great. Uh, well, and you can ice skate too. I mean, you can't golf in the oh, winter. Yeah, you, you can ice and ice fish as well for anyone that knows what that actually is. But we do have ice fishing as well. That's not for the faint of heart. I would say I would only do that if I was in a very well-equipped ice house, which would be an actual like house out on the lake. <laughs> right. Absolutely. And very bundled up. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Um, we also have Adam with us today. Of course, Adam Sandman has been a programmer since the age of 10. He's been working in the IT industry for the past 20 years, and he is currently the director of technology at Inflectra, where he's interested in technology, business, and innovation. Adam, your, what is this, your 24th fun fact? And, and the okay. problem with simply testing is I don't necessarily remember what I've said the time before. So it could be this could be new, it could be repeat. I don't remember anymore. The, um, so I was I'm not a big I must admit I'm, I'm surrounded by two two accomplished sports people here and I'm not so much of a sport person. I was more of the geek in school. So my fun fact is as I've always been a Doctor Who fan. I was a sci I'm a sci-fi nerd. Doctor Who is my thing. My mother, loved, the great thing with Doctor Who is it's, it's a show that's multiple generations. My mother grew up on it in the 60s, I grew up on it in the 80s, and my kids watch it with me uh, in the 19, 2000s, and uh, my daughter's now 17, and she still likes Doctor Who. Uh, and in fact, every computer in our office is named a Doctor Who character, and in our test management tool, if you type the word TARDIS, the screen shakes. We actually have some Easter eggs of Doctor Who vintage in the application. Um, my second fun fact is related to, you made me think of this one, is that in school I hated PE with a passion. And I always told them, I'll never do any any ball sports. You, I don't care what sport it is, if it's got a ball, it's not for me. So they were very imaginative in my school and they said, okay, what about badminton? And actually it's the one sport I'm good at to this day is badminton because there's no ball. Just, uh, yeah, that's amazing. Yep. Yep. Play to your strengths. That's right. 
And it's sort of it's inside, and it's inside. I live in Great Britain where it rains, so inside was another key factor. No mud, no rain, inside. So badminton is great. That's perfect. It's the perfect sport. Mm -hmm. And I did watch Doctor Who growing up, by the way. Like oh, that really? was in my family. So I know all about Doctor Who. People will ask me about Star Trek, Star Wars. I didn't watch that as much, but Doctor Who I watched. So wow. the Sonic Screwdriver and Wait, who is your Doctor Who? Which is the one that you grew up with? Um, I grew up, so I'm bad with names, so I'm going to be bad at which one, but he had very curly hair, so he had mm -hmm. very kind of curly hair, taller gentleman. Big long scarf? Or not, yes, not, long uh, scarf. Probably Tom Baker then. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Did they change over the years? Yeah. Oh, they change every three years, roughly. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Like, they're well, like presidents. Like, yeah, or 007, James Bond changed right, too, right? right? Kind of like mm -hmm. that, but more often. So right, has the show been going on for decades and they just changed the main character every three oh, years? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Every, every three years or so they change. It, it's, and they build it into the whole, into the canon. They, it's called a regeneration. So that when you get Keir shot, you've got infinite lives. or Well, it's not infinite, but it's a long story. But X number of lives. And when you die, you, you regenerate in a new body. And it was originally because the actor who played him was too old. So they, the BBC had to cut costs said, well, let's just get someone else to play him and we'll build it into the mythology. And it took off, so and it, it's kept the show fresh. And we now have our first female Doctor Who in 50, 50 years. That's awesome. Wow. I, I need to get back on Doctor Who. I stopped when I was in high school, like my dad and I would watch it and I stopped. Mm -hmm. So I need to get back into it now. That sounds amazing. And now they actually have money for sets on CGI. So it doesn't look like styrofoam blocks being thrown on, through, a, through a, a, a quarry. It actually looks like you might have, be in a real science fiction world. And, and they've really given a lot more updating. The kids now is, I think, really expect high quality drama, good acting, good scripts, not just lame 1970s special effects and, you know, kind of throwaway acting. So it's really, the quality is, is infinitely better than it was. Um, I think the, you know, the, the, the Netflix generation demands that. Yeah, I love it. That's awesome. I'm getting back into it. You taught me something already. Cool. <laughs> we'll have to have a watch party. Yes, Let's I love it. it. Watch party. We're, I'm in. <laughs> awesome. Jen, could you tell us a little bit about how you got from college golf to owning your own business? Yeah, um, I had a, I, I really did, it, and I know not a lot of people would maybe say this about their careers, but mine was actually kind of planful and purposeful. So at the age of five, I was the oldest of three girls. And at the age of five, like I was impressed that Adam at 10 was programming. At five, I was um, creating businesses to redistribute toys in my neighborhood, and <laughs> which I thought was a lovely idea because no one was using the toys. So we would have a system of you brought the ones you didn't want. We would have a ticketing system. You got tickets. We would redistribute, give them to other kids who wanted them until my parents started to get phone calls saying, your daughter is stealing all the toys in the neighborhood. Because <laughs> that wasn't what was working, but that was the interpretation of some of the kids when they didn't get enough tickets for their toys. So, you know, I started at about five wanting to be an entrepreneur. So that was um, in my blood early on. And after college, I worked for Accenture and I did implementations. So my background wasn't even um, programming or tech um, in school. I had thought I would be international business operations, um, running international companies and businesses with a really heavy business background, which is why I went overseas and was in London and studied over there for a period of time as well in the business program at the London Business School. So looked at all of that. And then when I came back, wanted to work for Accenture to feel out what types of industries did I like, what organizations felt right to me without committing. I, I felt like that was a really good chance to work in consulting and not have to commit to an industry or a company before I understood what they were all about. And through that experience, decided I would have three things I wanted in my career at that time. It was to work in retail because I love fashion and retail. So I said, I will work for a retailer at one point. I wanted to work in biotech. I was always big into um, the um, juncture between tech and the body and how we heal and all of that. So biotech was another target of mine that I wanted to work in. And the last one was really um, actual tech, like making technology after I had worked at Accenture working on implementations. And so I planned kind of out that way and that's kind of the trajectory I went on to gain different experiences. Worked at Oracle for a long time and then 
um, took a sabbatical when I had a parent who fell ill because I was traveling a lot and all over the world um, doing events and things in next gen tech. So um, that was my opportunity for about six months to decide what I was going to do next. And I took then what I thought would be maybe a one year juncture um, into a small company at the time that was, you know, not very big. It was, I think we were under 25 people um, and helped them grow to a significant size and really got my legs feeling like, okay, I could maybe do this, right? Like I now have the courage. It's not just a big company. Cause actually when I went to that organization, one of the things they told me is they said, well, you do realize you don't have the big name behind you anymore. You don't have Accenture, you don't have Oracle. How are you gonna figure this out without being able to have that credibility through the name? And so that was my trial of, can I do this on my own without the name? And I stayed way longer than I intended, but it was a great run, amazing people, um, but way longer. And then it was time to go. Like, I just felt like we needed more female CEOs with diverse perspectives in tech and, you know, it was time to launch and I had all the experience I felt like, or as best as you could. My last year of entrepreneurship is like dog years of experience, but it's like I've gotten 20 years in the last year. But it that's how I got there was, you know, it's time. And we really learned about social impact. So we were all about, you mentioned it in the bio, social impact with entrepreneurship. So to us, those go hand in hand. It's a key tenant of what we're building um, in how we go to market with anything we do. Cool. That's great. Um, I know, I mean, sorry, that was a lot. It's interesting, the one, the one thing that's interesting is that a lot of people when they want to start a business, they don't know what to do. So advice I was given by an entrepreneur I met randomly in Oxford when I was, I, was going, I went to see a play and I was late, so we came in at the same time. And he owns a clean, like his company now makes clean air, nitrous oxide removal stuff. He's a guy lives in California, but uh, he told me if you don't know what you want to do when you're you, when you're finishing college, what do you? How do you get that first rung on the ladder? His advice, and anyone listening, is consulting, which is the same thing. I think you, the advice you got was take consulting, especially if you're young and you don't necessarily have the idea yet to start something. Consulting will give you great experience in different industries, and you'll, it's like a paid MBA to some degree. Um, yeah. And I worked for Sapient. It wasn't as big as Accenture, but you, you got the range of industries you'd never get in one company when you're young. Well, in the training, right? So yeah, we yeah. had. After when I started Accenture, they don't still do it, I believe, anymore. But there was a organ, or there was a camp <laughs> called St. Charles that they sent you to to get experience. So it was like another two months, depending on what your role was, anywhere from one month to three months that you would stay there, and they would put you through rigorous consulting courses on mm -hmm. how to interact in business meetings what to dress like how to engage at a business dinner like even etiquette on what forks and spoons and knives and all the things are appropriate i mean all of that who'd have thought right, right? like it was such a good education it was right. like most college meets prep school meets like how do you actually engage in business which i don't think we always get today and so it was this fabulous real world education too mm -hmm. right that's fantastic have you had the opportunity to conduct any business on the golf course? So uh, actually, yes. So I, and it's been involved with our philanthropy as well. So um, there is, we're in Minnesota. So for folks that don't know, um, I'm from Minnesota and Minneapolis and there's a former Viking. So not all of you may be Viking fans or football fans, but he was a former NFL player that started a charity called Lead the Way for Children. And it's all about giving back to the children when they are in a hospice, in a hospital situation, but embracing tech with that as well. So um, giving them positive outlets while they're in that situation. So we um, just did the annual golf tournament and charity tournament with him. So I try and pair a lot of the things I'm doing on, with um, passions or things I've loved with um, social impact and the things we're doing broader and bringing folks that we care about um, to those events, because I think there's a lot of synergy when you can bring your passions together. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that's great. So have you had a chance to do the fashion part and the biotech parts yeah. of your goals? Yeah, so I did both of those as well. So funny enough, I worked for Target Corporation, which is headquartered in Minnesota as well. So I had the experience directly working for a retailer at Target 
um, and love that experience, understanding how it works, supply chain, all of the things. And then um, worked in an organization that does um, pacemakers and medical devices, um, looking at testing of that. And I think that's a really important experience for people who've never had it. And Adam can probably speak to this too. It's different when you're testing something that is about 0.001% less defects saves more lives um, than when it's just a retail application. And if I mess it up, people can't buy shoes. Mm -hmm. right like there's a huge disconnect between shoes and someone living or not living right so i right. think those were great experiences to give me the perspective of importance and risk and all kinds of things we think about in testing but having that full gamut of it so i did do both and then at oracle i have to say this when i was at oracle i had the opportunity to do fashion week gucci high-end brands Dior. Wow. That was brilliant. I was like, please don't ever let this end. I'm like, I know exactly how much overhead is on Dior versus Gucci versus Louis. Like I know which one uses better products. Like that was the best like personal education I've ever received at work. That would be pretty fascinating. Yeah. Wow. yeah. <laughs> so I know all those things, but sworn to secrecy, but I know personally. So if you ever watch what I buy, when you go to any of those high-end malls, then that's just the indication of what I would focus on if I were you. <laughs> the next time we're a supply chain analysis of what, what goes into them. Yeah, yeah, right. So the next time we're at a conference, I'm, I'll be watching. Yes, be watching. Yeah, yeah. It's always a tell what I gravitate towards because I learned a lot about their whole manufacturing supply chain process, who has ethical supply chains, you know, how they treat their employees, what the markups are on the goods versus what you pay, all of that. Mm -hmm. Very fascinating. That would be fascinating. Behind the, behind the curtain. Yeah, behind the curtain, definitely. <laughs> okay. Well, let's go into some questions from our guests this week. Um, Ayush, asks now this is one of those ones jen where you can interpret very broadly okay? okay what is the worst scenario you have come across oh there goodness no particulars I, to it that so if if you're ready to take it on jen or if you want to think a little bit about it i can throw it no, i'm ready to get this one so um I, I think one of the the hardest things for me um, and this was actually at Oracle, and I don't know if some of our viewers right now, some of them may have worked with me at Oracle and may know this story as well. Um, but we were working on um, a project and we would get, I always called it the red phone. So they would call us when stuff goes horribly wrong. Like this is when it's completely off the rails and the customer, whoever bought the software is incredibly angry. The implementer who is implementing the software, because keep in mind, Oracle didn't implement a lot of their own software. They use third party implementers. The implementer is so angry at Oracle that it's not funny. And literally you're walking in to just this hornet's nest of you are the um, you're the man that's coming in to like do all the things or the person, I should say, coming in to do all the things. Um, and they're angry at you because you're Oracle. Right. And you're not only Oracle, but you're corporate Oracle. So let's direct all the anger at this individual right now that we feel towards this whole engagement. And oftentimes it's been going on for six plus months. So the level of anxiety, anger and disappointment that's built up is pretty significant. So being dropped into those situations was really challenging at first and learning how to navigate that type of, of situation where you're walking in fresh, you haven't been involved, but really hearing and having empathy for everyone who has been involved for six months and how to diffuse some of that anger to get to root cause and core issues. And one of those in particular involved in implementation in Dubai. And in this situation, there was a very high end um, retailer who um, in Dubai, you can't sell Gucci and Armani just as Gucci and Armani, you have to sell it through an Emirati store. So this organization was Emirati owned. So um, that was the customer. They had three implementation partners on site doing different roles and functions um, who all had different chain of command. And the program was way off track. They had over 900 defects that had been locked on our product. Yeah, it had gotten bad. And so we went in and we had to try and tackle this problem, but everyone was so angry. So the first thing is diffuse the situation 
let them be angry. Like let them tell you all the things that make them upset, but do it on an individualized basis so that they don't all gang up on you at once. Take it one bit at a time and work through it. And then what we found when we did this, and we actually just stepped back coming as an external party, was a lot of these defects were based on conveyor belts. So they had logged over 600 issues on conveyor belt functionality on Oracle system. I, we said, can you take us to the warehouse? I wanna see these conveyor belts that are so horribly failing with our supply chain software. So we went to the warehouse, guess what? There's no conveyor belts in the warehouse. I said, so, so how'd we get these defects? Like, where'd these come from? Like, why are we logging 600 defects on conveyor belts we don't own? They said, well, we just took the Oracle user guide and tested every line in the user guide of what the functionality was supposed to be. And it doesn't <laughs> do these things. And I said, valid point. You're absolutely right. There's probably some broken functionality in the system, but how about we scope this to the things that are gonna be impactful to us, right? Not the conveyor belt, all of that. Well, what really matters to the organization to get this implementation out the door, not those things. We got down to 12 core defects through that process, but it was horrible. Like that was, it was a horrible situation to walk into, but I think sometimes my advice on this would be some of the most challenging situations we are placed in as human beings teach us the most about how to problem solve, have empathy and be resilient in that situation, which was all of my training I received through that process was just how to have empathy, listen, problem solve, like get to the root cause, right? I mean, I couldn't believe people had worked for months logging these defects and you should see the emails about hey, how angry they were. No one was fixing the conveyor belt issues. And I'm like, but, but I failed to see the reason. <laughs> Even if we fixed them all, how that would help you other than thank you for Q&A the owner's manual of the system that you're not using that piece of, right? I mean, thank you. That was good research that we will take back to that team and they need to go fix that. So that's what I would say. Wow. <laughs> that's a lot of defects for no conveyor belts. Yes, exactly. We were amazed. We were like, how has no one figured this? Sometimes you go, like, have you ever had these moments in work where you're like, I can't be the first person that saw this. Someone else must know that this is a problem, right? Like, this is too obvious. It was one of those things where I was like, am I gonna be punked? Is someone like gonna jump out and be like, haha, Jennifer, this wasn't a real one. We just wanted to see how right. long it would take you to figure it out. Well, there's a curtain <laughs> where the conveyor belts are hidden behind. I mean, it could be also be they're, they're afraid to tell the truth because the, the management and the culture in that organization means they may know there's no conveyor belts, but they've been told to test everything in the manual and they, they need someone outside to come in and basically the emperor has no clothes and it needs to be yes. someone outside. Yes, exactly. No, good point that that also happened a lot, right? Where, especially at Oracle, when we would come from the outside, it was, we would say the exact same thing we were hearing the team members say to other people, but they wouldn't, they weren't comfortable saying it themselves or no one was listening when they would say it. So we would say it and we're like, you do realize that we just said exactly what they were telling you, but now you're actually gonna do it, which to me in organizations is terribly sad for organizations, right? But it's because you're Oracle. You, 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 wrote the, you, know, you wrote the core software, you have the t-shirt, you know, you have the t-shirt, the business card. Yeah. They know that you're, well, yeah. they, want it, they don't necessarily trust their team, but they trust you, which is, I guess, a compliment in, in the trust yeah. they have in you, the vendor. Yeah. In a backhanded way. Yeah, right? right? <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, what's funny? What what's your well, work? I, mean, I was like, yeah, more from consulting than in Fletcher. In Fletcher, we're we're a product firm, so we do deal with sticky situations. And Jessica, that's mm -hmm. your your often your department. In fact, like today we had some. But for the most part, because we're selling a tool, our problems are more standardized. We don't get as much of that in the consulting world. Uh, the the problem with consulting was often that we a lot of we were doing IT consulting, especially a lot of your people are engineers first and foremost. And reality is a lot of the problems are not really engineering problems. And sometimes you've got a problem where the client's mad about something, as you mentioned, but the engineers want to like fix the problem. And really, the client doesn't want you to fix the problem; they want you to listen to the problem. And and that may be all you have to do is just listen and be sympathetic, and you know maybe change the course slightly. But the danger is engineers who are not consultants will often want to try and fix it technically, and that will usually enrage the client more. Uh, the one I always think of was when we used to work for the U.S. Marine Corps, who are you know they're a very tightly wound organization, and this was in 2002. We built a logistics piece of software that was going to be shipped off to Iraq, and we were going to be training people on it. 
But the program that we'd written, uh, some custom software that we'd written for the Marine Corps, um, at the Marine Corps were in the process of rolling out Oracle ERP, the business suite to all of their units, but it wasn't ready yet. So it was kind of a stopgap solution. And the, the danger was that the person in charge of the program was afraid that if we were too successful, then it would make the larger program in jeopardy. Because why do we need this expensive Oracle ERP when this stopgap solution can do it? Which it really couldn't, but that's what the people would see of the budget. And so we were called, hauled into the, the Pentagon to try and explain as contractors to these, these Marines. Bunch of Marines, they bring me in, I'm, I'm British. At that point, I don't, I don't even have my green, I have my green card, I wasn't even a citizen yet. And I'm wearing like a shirt, a bright blue version of this shirt. I wasn't dressed for business because I didn't know I was going to be in a meeting that day. And I literally had to come on a taxi like that. There was no time to change. So I, I arrived in the Marine Corps and I had to go head to head with all these colonels and generals. And they're asking me all these questions about how can you deploy this and this and this and this. And I'm just, you know, listening, trying to answer their questions politely and explain what I know. And just, again, treat it as a relationship issue, not as a technical issue. In the end, they let us go, deployed it. In fact, they sent their folks to go with us to help train it the right way so that we wouldn't be undermining their message, which was fine with us. And so a lot of it was about trying to find a path that gave them a success. And they said, well, if you succeed, then our bigger program will be successful because you've paved the way as a chair of change management. The interim solution isn't going to threaten the long term. It's going to actually help prove the change management, help us train these people who are used to spreadsheets or pieces of paper. They've never used IT. And so I think by helping to change their minds about this was not going to prevent them rolling out Oracle, we'll actually make it easier later. I think that's what helped them see the value. If we tried to say ours is better than this or no, it won't, we'd have quickly gone down a rabbit hole of engineers versus engineers. So I think you listen to your clients, find a solution that makes everyone save face and win. Um, and also just and also be respectful and, and be knowledgeable and humble. I think that really worked in that conversation. I mean, I don't, I'm not fighting wars. They're putting their lives in the line for us. There's no way that I'm going to, you know, pretend that I know anything about, as much about the Marine Corps as they do. But uh, again, uh, being able to be a good consultant and a good good man, good a good facilitator of a good solution is really important. And not trying to fix a problem that might not be actually a, a technical problem. Right. Um, Arlene, hi, Arlene. Arlene. Again, Arlene, actually, too, going back to Doctor Who, points out that Tom Baker had 14 seasons. He was the longest, I think. Three. That's probably why I knew him, because yes. he was there a long time. That makes so much sense, because yeah. that's all I remembered. So I'm like, was I in a time warp? Did like, I not age <laughs> for like 10 years of my life? I and feel I better now. Tell her I feel so much better that it wasn't just, I like blanked out like seven years of my life and he was there actually long. No, you're not crazy. And Jeannie but. says the 10th doctor was the best, David Tennant, <laughs> who is one of my favorites. And actually, if you, I rotate the camera slightly on my wall. Oh my God, look at that. There's the, there is uh, Chris Eccleston and there's David Tennant. And there is the new lady, uh, Jodie Whittaker. And so there you go, on my That's wall. That's In case awesome. you were wondering about his commitment to Doctor yeah. Who. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's real. He's got a real commitment to Doctor Who, which I love. You know, you just you just found another fan, right? Like I'm gonna go back in now and start watching. They can thank you for single-handedly increasing promotion and distribution of Doctor Who. <laughs> I get no, I get no, I get no credits. Although the the guy we launched it was in my went to my high school in Swansea in Wales, so I have a connection to the show. There's yeah. Another fun, fact. Mm -hmm. another fun fact. There you go. See? You should have held on to that one. You've got more of these to go. I think I used that a few months ago. I don't know. I get mixed up. <laughs> Beer talking. Uh, right. Um, so Arlene, Arlene, thanks for your question this week. Arlene asks, is there a product that you see coming that will help with online education? And might they be different for adults or for children or for everyone? Yeah, so you're nodding. You want to go ahead? Yeah, no, I was just going to say, um, yeah, so I think education is going to be massively revolutionized um, as we move forward. We're already starting work on um, virtual, imagine virtual schools, like virtual school buildings, where you could design a virtual school. Inside that school, you could have different virtual classrooms with different um, technologies inside the classroom that the students could engage with. Um, you could have tutoring areas where you could have the students get one-on-one -on -one support inside that school building. So think of all the things you have in a physical school today that would be virtualized inside an environment with technologies and tools to support the students. So that's actually being built out right now, um, leveraging a lot of different technologies and AI and some other things inside of organizations. We're actually working on a project with an organization called Dream Tank 
and Dream Tank is actually building, um, they have a patent to build a global game where you drop into the Dream Tank and imagine you drop into this um, virtual headquarters for Dream Tank as a youth. You're greeted by an avatar who gives you the rules of how you engage in the Dream Tank. So you have rules of operations, right? Like what you can and can't do, how you be yeah. respectful or not. Um, and there's monitoring in there using AI to monitor your chats, if you're being respectful, if you're engaging well with others, if you're using nonviolent yeah. communication, all of those things inside there. And then there's offshoot rooms where you can focus on goals that you have, projects or passion areas. And they're able to focus on environment or the ocean or sustainability of our land, you know, those types of projects and come up with ideas as youth together in collaboration across the globe inside this virtual game. And then they have currency, which is like, um, just like we have now with, um, it's called dream coins, but it's currency they can exchange and earn inside the world. And then the entrepreneurs that come up with products or ideas can actually engage and sell their products inside the dream store. So it's like a self-sustaining little world for youth to learn how to become entrepreneurs, engage in sustainability, engage in other activities and learn things inside of it. So um, it's coming really quickly, I think, actually. So. That sounds really cool. Is it like a 3D immersive or is it like it's on a flat screen? How does it's on a flat screen right now. It will eventually be. Um, uh, there is the race to the UN right now. The UN turns 75 October 24th and it's called the Youth Takeover of the mm -hmm. UN. And as part of that, um, they're de debuting some of this technology in extended reality, which extended reality is the new one off of virtual reality and augmented reality mm -hmm. that we're working on. So extended reality does the next to me function at a high level that you've seen before where it looks like instead of this, where we look like we're all sitting separate, where it appears that we're all in the room together next mm -hmm. to each other. So it gives more inclusivity of feeling all together as opposed to separate. Um, but it also has some other technologies and that is a headset. But the way that um, we're working to build with the youth is we want this to be accessible to any youth with just a screen or a computer or a tablet, not or a phone, not to have to have special headsets and things because that's cost prohibitive for a lot of children. So we want to be able to gift them the hardware that's simple to be able to get into the global virtual game for youth. That sounds amazing. And it's, it's so fun. Kids are so fun. They have the best ideas, I tell you. <laughs> Was it a collaborative effort with kids? Yeah, it's all youth driven. So they actually did a hackathon to come up with how to orchestrate the game. Um, they came up with how to design the world, the avatars they designed. So one of the avatars, um, the children liked um, otters. So one of the avatars is an otter. Right. It's it looks like it's an otter. So and and they built all the videos. So what the otter says and the scenarios for the chatbot, that's AI. It's an AI otter chatbot. Um, they came up with the scenarios of how you would talk to it and all of that. So, yeah, it's their it's their vision just implemented in reality in coordination with um, adults to help them support and just really support them. That's a really cool. Adam, what about you? What do you see coming down the pike? Whew, education. I, I must. I'm disclaim. I'm not particularly, you know, knowledge about the education field. EdTech's not something I do. I do a lot of work in. I mean, I guess as a parent, I've seen that with this year just the, the transition when we went to virtual learning in March, completely. I mean, completely unprepared. The, the school districts basically had to take whatever was on the shelf and largely just use it for a few months until they could get to summer and just hope they could keep it together using things like Google Classroom and very traditional. Uh, tech space and maybe some some you know Zoom-like uh, facilities, uh, and and it, they they kind of got through the few months. It seems right now that they're still they've they've got things in a better position, but they're mostly relying on this kind of almost lecture base. So one of the challenges I think will be is that um, adults, well generally speaking, adults uh, you know and college age students are used to the idea of a lecture. You, you're given assignments, you're given work, and you take it away and you come back, which, so the, the virtual learning has been reasonably okay for that. My son's in university doing, uh, on, actually on campus, we're doing everything virtual. So it's sort of, he's in a small room that he can't really leave, but it's all virtual. So he's sort of on campus, but not anyway. Um, but the reality is that therefore everything's screen-based, but he's found it reasonably okay from a learning standpoint. He misses the social side, but at his age, lectures largely fit that pattern. 
when you get to younger grades, um, it's a much normally more immersive experience. And my daughter says, says even in high school, they've got half the amount of time spent interactive and twice as much during offline assignments. So they're basically getting more of a college level you know, type of teaching, which is not really appropriate. And for some students who, are, who maybe are not ready for that, they, they're not getting they're not going to get the support they would have had. And as you go to the younger, younger grades, it's the same problem. So most of the platforms that they're using are really built for adults, like like Zoom or GoToMeeting or whatever they're using. And they haven't been adapted for younger kids. They're just saying, deal with it, parents fill the gaps, and this will all be over soon, so don't worry about it. I think if schools had an education, knew this was going to be around for 10 years long term, they can invest. The thing for a lot of these ed tech providers right now is they're afraid to invest too much because who knows in three months, six months, there's a vaccine, there's treatments, dot, dot, dot. Maybe this can't, it's not worth the investment. So it's very hard to justify the investment, I think. Um, some of the things I've seen that the kids have found on their own is, like my daughter said, that all her friends use Discord, which is a sort of a gaming platform for, for collaboration. And no teacher said, oh, to talk to your friends about the assignment, use Discord. They just started doing it. All the college, cl all the clubs in my daughter's school are all on Discord. Quiz Bowl, Science Olympiad, Real Crimes. I mean, there's a whole bunch of clubs they have which she's involved with. And they've kept in touch completely on their own. So the kids are kind of figuring this, some of this stuff out. I think EdTech, if, if, this, if this persists, EdTech really needs to focus on the younger grades. How do you create a more immersive experience that's not an hour a day followed by class you know, offline work? It's really continuous, much more of, an, of a teaching, not a lecturing. And I don't know how you do that. I, I don't know what's, have any school systems figured this out for the younger grades, do you think? I, I'm, I'm not sure I know. No, I think it's coming. Like I said, I really feel like this is coming, but no one's got it yet. The closest I've seen is what I just mentioned with the platform, because right. um, they, like you said, it's, they haven't figured it out yet. And that's where the younger ones really struggle. And and I think our education system in general now with what's happening, there are certain students based on their style of learning and how they learn that will do right. just fine. And there's other, the majority who, there's one style that probably this works well for and the rest of those styles, this isn't working very much for right. them. So it's a real big struggle, I think, for multi-learning style engagement and stuff like that. So whatever platform it is needs to take in the different learning styles into account. Um, and test it, I think, on those different learning styles to see the effectiveness. Yeah. Uh, how do you see, Jen, how do you see AI platforms gaining a foothold in heavily regulated industries, such as banking and, banking and finance, and in what capacity? Yeah, so um, there's a couple of companies I've seen recently um, who have been able to take some of what I call, so I look at it as, um, I'm a big believer, different people have different philosophies around AI. Um, I believe in humanized AI solutions where we look at what humans do well, we look at what technology does well, and we pair them together so that humans can spend more time doing the things they do well and leverage technology to take some heavy lifting. So I think where there's been some impact is on some of the diffing technologies um, to do diffing on plans, diffing on different documents, um, dipping on statements, identifying, going through large volumes and identifying fraud and some of the things that you can detect when you have a bot that goes through millions of transactions, whereas a human, it would take a very long time to find that same pattern. So I think it's about pattern recognition functions, things that where you can leverage a virtual research assistant. That's what I call them, your virtual research assistant, to go grab all that heavy lifting and data scan through millions of things and give you possible outcomes, right? But then you as a human have to validate which of those scenarios make sense and is there any bias in the data set that was put in that it searched where it came up with an ineffective outcome that doesn't make sense to you as the human that knows the system. Adam? Right. Yeah, I mean, they, I mean, they're using AI in banks right now for, you know, for all the fraud alerts, unusual activities. When you're trying to find atypical patterns, um, that's mm -hmm. where it seems to be already being deployed in large scale. The other industries that are highly regulated where I do, where it's already being used or, and certainly will be, will be things like insurance, looking for claims that are, fall outside a certain parameter. Um, I remember that we had a talk at our, our Inflectricon conference last year where um, one of our colleagues in Germany was talking about how they're using AI together with GPS and, look, and combs through social media so that if someone says they're a non-smoker and they get the non-smoking claim rate, well, the system will analyze their patterns of where they go, what they do, and their movement patterns. The person left the house every hour to go outside and went back in again. Wonder what that was. Probably smoking <laughs> outside. 
And so, but they, they're able to do that. And so be able to monitor their public information. And that's why in Germany, of course, data privacy is such a big issue. But any, but right, even in America, where you don't have data privacy, things like HIPAA, in theory, prevent some of that, but not necessarily on insurance data. And so the computers can mine that information, put it together and come up with patterns of things that you do that, you, that don't match what you say you do. And I know that doctors are using this for diagnosis tracking because doctors will often try to diagnose based on uh, historical precedent and bias of what they've done before. Computers can give them a second opinion uh, in diagnosis to help them get a more, a more objective uh, diagnosis. And I know with the coronavirus, they've been using computers to actually try and figure out potential existing treatments that statistically might work and that will be worth putting into a clinical trial because you only have so many clinical trials you can do. You can't try every generic drug out there. So it's pretty cool what we're doing that. We're using human, as Jen said, human augmented AI to be able to use the best of the two worlds and bring them together, rather than having the sort of Skynet, you know, Terminator yeah. AI that we all fear. Right. No, that is that's really cool. Um, the conversation's been so interesting. I forgot to stop and talk about our drinks. So, yes, yes Jen, what are you drinking today? You know what? I have a product I love. So it's not a product ad because I mean, unlike and I get no kickbacks for this product, but I have to talk about it because um, a lot of the individuals in our office drink beer. And so I'm not a beer drinker. So they'll be like, oh, at the end of the day, let's have a beer. And I'm like, well, that doesn't work for me. So I'd have to crack open a whole bottle of wine and be like, okay, I'm not drinking this by myself. So they came up with these here. See if you guys can see them. Ooh. Isn't this cool? It's a, a this is a red. This is a red one of it. It's called Unusual. And they actually are made without all the additives and stuff, but it comes in a little tiny bottle. You get a case of them, just like you do beer. So I just actually have their brute one, their sparkles. So I have the sparkly one, but it comes in a single glass. So like I could do sparkles and next I could do red and I'm not committed to a whole bottle of it. That's genius. So it's That's, awesome. And it's such a pretty bottle. It looks like a Gemini space capsule. I know, isn't it cool? <laughs> like, love the packaging it's called unusual but there's several of them out there but it's such a cool concept i think and then they don't put in the um additives so it's it's for people that say i get headaches or whatever from wine the sulfites yep yep yeah they don't put all the sulfates and chemicals so it's mm -hmm. naturally sourced that's why um it's called usual 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 okay we'll usual. have to look that up i haven't seen that around here adam have you um, I, have, I must admit, I haven't looked. I, I, I go to Costco and get a case of the big bottles of wine, but that's a whole other story. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, it's a, but it's a problem because usually you want a glass of wine and you end up drinking half a bottle or a bottle and then you wish you had the next day. Uh, exactly. That's what I've been told. Oh, so I've been told. I, I, right. <laughs> theoretically, that could happen. That right? is apparently a theoretical possibility. <laughs> <laughs> Adam, Love what it. are you drinking? Oh, well, um, I am, because it's, it's a Thursday. If it was a Friday, I might have done a cocktail like last week. But today I'm doing mm -hmm. a beer. It is an IPA from a Salisbury, Maryland. So it's a local IPA. Evo is the brewery. It's called Blurred Vines. And it's an IPA with Mosaic, Equinox, and Cascade hops. I love wine, beer. I'm not actually, I'm very, I'm ecumenical when it comes to booze. Uh, wine, beer, spirits, gin, vodka, tequila, any of it. It's all good to me. Uh, but this is a nice little IPA and it's it's local, um, so I can't recommend it enough. If you get so much of your booze at Costco, how are you finding all these little local, every time you're on, it's a new local beer? Well, actually, okay, and I love, I, and I love Costco, but I'm not promoting them for that reason, but this um, this actually was from Costco. They've, they've started a program at Costco where they'll have uh, four packs of local breweries, only local to that store. Because one of the problems for a lot of these small uh, breweries and, and wineries is they can't ship enough for, for someone like Costco because they need a na for their national distribution, they need to produce a very large number. Most of them can't produce the minimum quantity for Costco, but they've started now sourcing locally. So the Costco in Maryland will have a different, or DC, will have a different stuff than say in, in Minneapolis. They're not requiring the same volume. So it's allowing some of, the, some of these smaller establishments to get into the larger stores, which is really good. So um, these are actually all from Costco, these, these unique ones. I usually go up the road to my house as well though. I'm not okay. just because I have to cross. I have to go into the city because Maryland doesn't allow Costco to sell beer and wines. So I have to go all the way into DC and back. Okay, I'll have to check that out. To so DC Costco. Yes. Costco. Oh, be careful! Be careful! You, your credit card will come back irreparably be damaged. Well, Jamie used to go in Costco in Delaware because there was no tax. So oh, yeah. uh, my husband. Is, so when he would travel, when that kind of thing used to happen. He yeah. would come back with, I mean, people would follow him around the store and be like, 
where's your party? That's what I get. <laughs> yeah, because we're not that big. Um, so I think it's the day of sparkling wines. We didn't even talk about it, but I also have a sparkling can of Sophia Brut. Is it good? Is yeah, do you um, like them? Um, uh -oh. I wouldn't no. say that. No, it's not that I dislike it. I I'm trying to be honest. I think it's delicious, but my palate isn't particularly sophisticated. Okay. You know, I'll kind of what's closest. I found this in my fridge. So. Yeah, what's easy? But what an easy distribution form too for it, right? So you don't have to open right. a whole bottle of champagne. That's right. Right. I mean, there's something Ooh, really right. novel still about these individual sized servings of beer of wine. Beer, it's been forever. Right. But to have a can of sparkling wine, that's super fun. Unless you're on the planes. The planes of the airlines had this. See, now, now they've had the monopoly on this because they have the little champagne bottles, the little wine bottles. That's true. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. But yeah, this is kind of fun. So, I love okay. It. Back to testing. But I'm glad we were on the same wavelength. That was kind of cool. It must be a Midwestern yeah. thing. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> okay. Um, Violetta is another one of our regulars it's great to have her this week and she asks a pretty big question which is i don't know about ai where do i start what should a tester know about ai in the modern world and how is ai changing the it industry so if you have the weekend we can address this question but please <laughs> no, go ahead and, yeah no in a nutshell what i would say to just get started so I've been um, saying this a lot this year, just because um, I believe I've, been, I've read a lot of articles on it um, as well, but my thought was always that everyone should know a little bit about AI and machine learning because to be familiar with what's being built and what people are doing and how it's being used in your consumer life and how people are leveraging it on you as a consumer, not only just as a tester or a professional, but as a consumer. And so, uh, my big thing is I don't care if you're a technologist or a entrepreneur or a politician or anyone, you should all have base information on the technology that's being built, who's building it, how they're building it, are they building it ethically, um, looking at conscious consumerism, like it, the companies I'm working with, are they building products in the way that I as a consumer agree with and how they're leveraging people's data, like really Recently, there is a company that you would all know if I said the name where you would swab and give them your DNA and they were using that to give you your ancestry, right? Like, and we all thought, oh yeah, I'm signing up. I'm going to do it. Well, now they have all that data and keep in mind, machine learning is algorithms and data sets. They have all that data in a database and that company was sold to another company that's a private equity company that does nothing in the space of DNA as is in terms of giving you your ancestry, but what they wanted was the data sets. Mm. And they just bought all of your data. And in that little disclaimer that you probably signed that was 12 pages long, it says that if they sell the company that your data goes with it and it can now be used for other purposes, right? So we have to be conscious about what we're signing up for when we're giving away even things like, I heard another one recently, which sounds awesome, and I was gonna do it, where they you take a swab and it tells you what nutritional def deficiencies you have, like in your like what you're not getting in your diet or what would help you um, feel more energetic and whatever, and I'm like, that sounds amazing. But if this company gets sold, who has my DNA? That's another way to get all of my DNA through that test, and so, I think of it as um, just educate yourself. There's a lot of articles on it right now. Andrew Ng, actually. So Andrew Ng, and um, NY, I think is how you spell his name. And he has a course through Coursera at Stanford. And it's Intro to AI. It um, starts September 28th. So I don't think we missed it yet. Four days. In four days, it starts. Um, and it's free. He's offering it for free. But he has stats on how impactful it's been in base education of AI to other people and getting jobs in AI or learning more about AI, it's an introduction to AI. So I think a free course online, especially now with a pandemic, instead of Netflix for a few nights, maybe try some of those courses. <laughs> Netflix is good too, but you can only have so much of that. But um, try Andrew's course on um, Intro to AI, that's a place I would start. Um, there's also some good reading, just to, to, to read some 
books. Um, there's one that's out. I think it's called AI Superpowers, China, Silicon Valley, and the rest of the world. This is a good knowledge of, we think of like the arms race that we've had or the Cold War. AI is the next big thing for whoever controls it has a lot of power and influence over the world. And so that book is a lot about, you know, the AI superpowers, <laughs> you know, who becomes a superpower. And it's literally China, Silicon Valley, and the rest of the world is what the book talks about. Mm -hmm. So get it. I would say just start with that. Start with a course to get facts. And then um, diversify. If you are doing reading on AI, there's lots of perspectives. Um, but avoid the echo chamber of AI because there's you'll start getting certain articles on. Um, if you start reading, they'll start sending you the same types of opinions on AI. So do diverse thought on AI. And there's a gentleman named Shelley Palmer that puts out every day an accumulation of articles on AI so you can see diverse perspectives. So Shelley Palmer's, um, if you sign up for his um, blog, you get tons of articles on AI all in one place too. But get diverse opinions. Like don't just go with one thing because you'll get this echo chamber of the same stuff and it's not always correct, to be honest, right. mm -hmm. or research. Okay. All right. Good tips. Adam. Uh, I, I, don't have, I don't have anywhere near Jen's expertise in AI, but I, it was interesting. I, I was introduced to AI when I was probably 11 because we, we had in a computer science course, they decided to do a, a semester on it. This is back in its very in its infancy and we did some basic uh, list processing and things. It was very, very, very primitive. But um, one of the things I always found fascinating was, you know, read about, learn, if you're interested in the, in, the, in the space, learning about Alan Turing and his original ideas is pretty is fascinating, the father of AI. And there's a novel actually that came out last, I think it's last year. So if you want something a bit lighter and, you, and you, you're tired of screens, you want a novel, uh, one book I would highly recommend is actually a fictional novel called Machines Like Me by Ian McEwan. He's, he's an amazing British writer. He's, he, he, wrote the no, he wrote the novel that became Atonement, the movie. Uh, Chess on Chesil Beach. He's the writer, um, The Comfort of Strangers. He's one of the. He's probably Britain's best fiction writer in the last ten years, and he's taken his hand to AI. And it's imperfect because it's obviously not a technical book. It's a novel, but it's called Machines Like Me, and it's set in an altered future of, 90, of 1985, where uh, Alan Turing didn't didn't die. He uh, he was able to live with his partner legally and. A lot of the advances we have now happened in the, in the 80s rather than the 2020s, 2010s. So it's a fascinating alternate view of what the 1980s could have been like had we had AI. And I think it's just a it's, it's a really interesting read. It's very approachable, and it and it, and it, it I don't know for me it was it, it was a great way to approach AI if you weren't someone who's in the in the field and a technologist. And I would I would recommend that. Great, good I'm tips. Yeah, it, it's it's a fun book too, and a little creepy, a oh. little black mirror, a little bl little bit of black mirror esque, mm -hmm. but not not too much. Okay. Um, I think yeah, we have time for a couple more here. Um, Jen, as a speaker, where do you draw your inspiration from, and what is your process for picking topics and bringing them to life? Yeah, so a lot of things are actually inspired by my children. <laughs> so I watch things at youth. It just, it, and again, spending more time with them recently, but um, my four-year-old and my 10-year-old both give me ideas. So um, for example, my idea, exactly the question she just asked about, how do you get started? My daughter came to me one day and she said, mommy, you do this thing in machine learning and AI, and I hear you talking about it all day long with people but I want to know about it. I want to understand it. And so she wrote the first children's book um, in my, the series that we're doing on AI and ML for children. So she inspired like that idea. And from there, it's been a series of things around how do you break it down and make it simple through the eyes of a child to help people understand what it is and not be scary, for example. So she gave me the inspiration for that. But a lot of the things that I work on come from them and just having them experience technology and thinking about what they're going through and how it's impacting their lives and watching people. And then the other one really is, um, again, I started at five as an entrepreneur. So I was very into solving problems I saw in the world. So it was all about, I see something that I don't think is working. How do we look at the problem and figure out a way to help? And so a lot of my talks are inspired on where I see things that people aren't focused on or aren't doing. And a lot of people for a long time would say to me, oh, a lot of what you talk about is, is so fuzzy. It's like the 
softy skills, the soft things. And the funny thing is now with AI, I would argue with as much technology as we have, being a good human with AI and technology means being a good human. And we have to remember how to think critically and problem solve and have empathy and be good leaders, right? Those things and those skills are gonna be so critical. And I was seeing we were starting to lose them as we just engaged mostly in our technical or what we call the techie side of our brain and really pulling in that other side of our brain and engaging creativity and the other components. So that's where I get it from is things where I see we're starting to diminish in skills or problems in the world or my kids. <laughs> I think that's great. That can make for really interesting topics. Yeah. Adam, you too. I know that you talk a lot about technical topics in you, your you talk talks. You, you want to say no. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, you, you, say, you talk a lot. So. <laughs> I don't want to say I talk a lot. I don't want to say as you talk too much. You should be quiet sometimes. <laughs> Out of the mouths oh, of babes. No, I'm kidding. Um, for the talks, it's interesting. I mean, I talk about a bunch of different things. What I found with the, there are two kind of ways I approach the talks. I guess I'm, uh, and also because we're trying to, I mean, the talks, when we go to, uh, disclaimer, when we go to a conference, we are trying to get business in it. So it's inevitable. We want to try and do talks that are engaging, but also potentially ones that will be useful for people wanting to come to our booth and you know meet us and want to engage with us. But um, I actually have asked, often asked the conference organizers, first of all, you know, what are, the, what are you seeing people asking for that you don't have people talking about? That was actually the first thing I did at STPCon. I asked Rick and I said, hey, Rick and Peggy, you know, I, I love to write some, I'm, I'm happy to write some, some speakers, some suggestions for speaking talks. I can talk about anything you like. Do you want automation, APIs, AI, whatever you want? And they said, well, we, we, we seem to have a lot of people asking about X and not a lot of talks about X. So I did a few talks on that. And then when, when people come to your talk, this is the next thing I would say is a talk, if you get a talk, then when the audience comes to you, they'll usually ask you questions. And usually in the time you have, you haven't got time to answer in a great deal of detail all the answers, but it may give you ideas for things that will be the next talk and the next talk after that. So I did a talk on APIs and then people said, what about security and performance? And I said, oh, that's a good idea. So I did one on security and performance. And then, um, so I think a lot of times, if you listen to the audience, they'll give you the, the seeds for what could be a good talk. And then even at the booth, uh, people will come by to us and I'll find, oh, people don't really understand this. They're, everyone's asking these same questions at our booth about something. And I think there's obviously a lack of education about it. And the other thing I would do is I'm a bit of a contrarian. So I'll look at the program. If everyone's talking about Selenium and web testing, that's the last thing I want to talk about. Like everyone's talking about that. What's different? And so find something that look at, well, look at the program. And if, and if you know your industry or you look at the industry, you'll quickly see, look, everyone's talking about this one aspect. There's all this other stuff. Why is no one talking about it? So look for the gaps. So that's sort of how I've approached it. I must get a more analytical kind of, you know, driven approach. But. Great. Um, Jen, what does testing look like five years from now and 10 years from now? You know, it's, it's always hard to predict the future, but I think um, what we'll see is AI is just another industrial revolution. It's another use of technology in our world in a different way. So I think a lot of the same things will still be here. Um, it'll just shift some of the tasks we do. So I actually think in my view of the world, um, if you imagine that these things are helping doctors determine your, determine your diagnosis, diagnosis, if you imagine that they are helping judges make determinations on sentence guidelines for individuals as they come through the court system, if they're doing more impactful things in deciding whether we get loans or don't get loans, whether we get financing for a home or not, whether we get insurance, I mean, I think when we see that, what becomes really apparent to me is critical thinkers who are analytical and can look at that information and understand the inherent problem in the data set or the bias that exists and raising those issues will be incredibly critical. So if anything, I think the role of testers and people with very good critical thinking, analytic problem solving skills is just magnified extremely, right, with these technologies. Because when more and more of our world is run off of AI decision-making systems and algorithms. We need advocates who are checking, testing, and validating those systems that are being used in the world. Like no one wants those types of things. There's actually, there's a film festival going on in the Twin Cities right now and the tech series is a brand new documentary on AI and what it does to our world in the future. And I think it's a good one to watch. So 
I will send it to you guys if you want to distribute it to the folks. Um, it's coming out here in October. A uh, brand new film. It's it's short. It's like an hour. I mean, I guess it's not super short, but it's an hour long and it's a documentary on um, what AI and bias in AI will do to our world. And I think it's a good way, as you mentioned before, how to get informed, you know, and and be an active participant in testing these systems, in raising issues and honing your skills in critical thinking and problem solving. Adam, do you have anything to add to that? I think Jen is absolutely right, 100%. I there was a, I, I don't remember his name. We, I went to a meetup here in DC when we had in person meetup still, and he was talking about Compass. That's the criminal criminal sentencing system. I forget, and it was racism yep. and AI, which was I hadn't thought of those as being in in the same talk. And it was for me it was an eye opener about the the implicit bias issues of these data sets where you're using biased data sets to generate the next the models. Um, and I think what what made me think of was what you said about testing. Uh, when we release medical devices, there's a very stringent FDA approval process. We, we have a lot of clients doing FDA, life science systems. It's incredible. I mean, we have a great system, and I know politics because someone's intruding on it, but there is a good system. Whether we choose to use it or ignore it is, is one thing, but it does exist. We know how to do it. There's an FDA, which you know, is close to my house, you know, living in, in the D.C. area. We've government agencies all around us. But who's doing AI? There's no federal department of AI. No one's... So if a court system says, if a vendor sells to a court system, hey, we've got this great tool that can help you, you know, standardize and improve your sentencing guidelines, who's doing the independent testing, the IV and V as it, on those systems? No one is. Policymakers don't understand what these things do. People are too, 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 too lazy. It's too, it's too, they're seduced by the technology. In the same way that a drug company said, oh, we've got this great drug, it's a miracle drug, it does all these things. Um, I was reading actually yesterday, the, um, there was a, a person who was a journalist who investigated a, a drug that was introduced in Europe in the 60s that would cause birth defects, thalidomide. And it would have happened in the US except for the FDA prevented it because you had someone there who said, no, we are not taking this. All the claims from the manufacturer have not been proven in any testing. And it, it's, a, it's an interesting story. The US was the only country that did not have the, the significant numbers of large, large numbers of birth defects that every other country in the world did because they did testing. So we need a, like an FDA of AI, people who are not incented by the vendors, incented by the users, but have an independent testing authority uh, of AI, because otherwise we're going to get more of this. Yep. Sorry, it's got my and soapbox. The, no, I'm on the same soapbox. I love this soapbox because I think people need to know it. The movie is called Coded Bias, and it's the coded bias movie about the coded bias that's built into these systems. And when you actually look at it, the, to Adam's point, the people building them know the bias is there and basically said, I can make money, I don't care. Mm -hmm. So this goes right. to the conscious consumerism. Watch the movie, it's called Codis, Coded Bias. It's a documentary. I think everyone should see some of what goes on. And the people in this movie are from MIT. They're incredibly smart individuals who did research and homework on this. So it's one of those things that the media may not talk about as much, but we need to, as te technologists, be aware of, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you for bringing that up. I think that's really important. And as someone who comes from outside of the tech field, I think it's so fascinating to hear people so knowledgeable about AI talking about uh, the empathetic side of things, the human analysis that needs to go into it, that it's not just, a, it's dangerous as just a data set that isn't examined. Um, so I'm really, I'm glad that you both brought that up. That's great. Thank you. Um, I think we can do one more question before we wrap it up. And this is kind of a fun, weird one. Adam has had this one a number of times. It's one of my personal favorites because it can elicit really interesting answers. So um, what is the most ridiculous, badly planned, ill-advised thing or feature or product or solution you have ever been asked to test? Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you want to think about it a minute and then go to Adam first? Oh. Adam clearly knows this one. I don't like, know. I've done this, well, I, I don't like doing the same one. I think I've, I've done this. Uh, I, I, I guess I can reuse one. Uh, the what? Well, if I, I'm going to reuse one because Jen's here and this is an Oracle story. Um, <laughs> you, you don't work for Oracle anymore, right? It's okay. No, no. I hey, no. And well, I Oracle, get Oracle I, had I, managed to persuade the Marine Corps that the, the Oracle business suite that I mentioned earlier. Not only could it be used when they were when they were back at base. But they had somehow managed to persuade them they could use it when they were in the field in the middle of in the middle of battle on PDAs and they could use it on, on military radios. And we were trying to do these radio tests 
Oh my goodness. So we drove, uh, what did we do? We drove out in a rental car out to 29 Palms, which is in the middle of the California desert. It's near Palm Springs, but it's nothing like Palm Springs. It's like a wasteland where they like bomb the, the desert. It all blows up and it's just a dust bowl. It's like being in Terminator after the apocalypse. And we're, we're there in a truck with these computer, these laptops and, trying to, and these radios trying to hook everything up. And they, they're doing a shortwave radio over to Cram Pendleton, which is you know hundreds and hundreds of miles away, trying to get this, this these ERP solutions to work. Well, they're not designed, they're designed to work on real networks, not on this radio stuff. And all these kids kept biking up on their little push bikes in the desert, like, what are you doing, mister? And like, ah, you don't want to know. So that was the craziest testing. I, mean, I think we kind of go to work. We said, yeah, it, it kind of works. Tell the general it worked. And then, you know, that was the end of it. But it was this crazy idea of trying to run these complex, heavy systems that weren't meant to be used over, a, you know, like 1,200 board, 400 board radios that were built for, for audio from World War II, literally World War II. I mean, it's like, this is not what it's for. Whoa. Yeah. I think I didn't hear that one, so okay. I'm not sure you missed it. Maybe. Good job. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, Jen, how about you? So, um, well, mine are tied. So crazy, not not in a bad way, but crazy. Like I'm like, you're not going to really expect me to do this, are you? So, um, mine was also military, but it was a system, a point of sale system to run on submarines which sounds easy enough, right? When you're on a submarine, you wanna be able to sell people on the ship things through the commissary. So they buy candy bars, they buy cigarettes. That's the most important, not the candy bar part. Cigarettes, you know, basic essentials that they need while they're on ship, right? They have to pay for that. Well, we built the whole system out and deployed it. Well, no one thought about when a submarine has to go offline, which can be for months, right? You have to turn a submarine offline so it's undetectable. So we were like, oh shoot, now what? Like, how do we take transactions? Like, this isn't gonna work. I'm like, we really should add someone who's been on a submarine before. Think about these things, right? Like, I've not been on a submarine except at Disney on that ride that you like go in and then you go underneath. I don't think that counts. So that was one of the crazier ones. And the other one was actually cruise ship technology, which again, both my stories involve ships. But the, if you think about it, a lot of us don't. On an average cruise ship, they call them portals, but they're really televisions turned sideways and they show you everything about that ship. There's over 250 of them on every cruise ship on average. Large cruise ships have many more, but to reset those portals without AI, so we were talking about using AI to reset portals because in order to reset a portal, it was like an Easter egg hunt. The technologist had to run around the ship and see which one had stopped working where it froze. Cause imagine all these portals or screens freeze like our computers when you don't reset them and have a magic key and then tap special on the screen to reset them. It was like a continual Easter egg hunt every day to think <laughs> which portals were broken. And you'd walk by and you'd be like, are we sinking? The ship has went from like this on the screen to tip <laughs> like this, like the Titanic. I'm like, this can't be good for people to see, right? That. <laughs> exactly. So it was insane. But on that same ship, we were able to get AI to order a drink and it chose a Cosmo. It was brilliant. And we actually received the drink. So it was fun, but crazy at the same time. That is wow. the perfect note on which to end. Fun and crazy. Exactly. And, and the bot bought a drink. Like at the end of the day, the bot just wants a drink too. <laughs> That's right. It's more human than we think. Mm -hmm. Yes. Programming. <laughs> Oh, uh, Jed, thank you so much for joining us today. This was really fun. I learned a ton. It was great to have you. Um, and I know despite the fact that we're all home right now, it actually really is a busy time. It's conference season um, and virtual. So it doesn't mean you're any less busy. So we appreciate your taking the time to join us and to join us next week at our conference in FlectorCon. Hopefully some of our attendees will be there too. Adam, thank you as always. And and we'll Jen, do, Jen, do you have anything like, is there a book you're working on? Or I have two children's book series. So yes. I'm doing a children's Ooh. book series on AI and ML. And it's, um, Gracie Gray is my lion. She's pink. And her best friend is Bot. And he's a AI bot. And they go on adventures together and they learn from each other. So the human machine teaming concept of how they team to teach kids about where the AI is present, how to look out for that, how to search data sets and analyze data and information to come to conclusion. That's great. Fantastic. Yeah. Teach kids to be critical thinkers. That's yeah, exactly. Yep.
So okay. I'm excited about it, but I'm very excited about the conference next week. Thank you guys for having me anytime. If you ever need someone, let me know I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Thank Jen. You. It was great chatting with you today. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Be safe. And